It says recording. Quiet. It's Go ahead, sir. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Wales Board of Education. Tonight is Tuesday, October 13th, 2020. This meeting is being held virtually in accordance with the governor's executive order. Ellen, may we get roll call, please? Yes, Mr. Carey. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? Mrs. Evans? Here. Mrs. Granado? Here. Mr. Lesser? Here. Mr. Michaels? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Present. Mr. Riley? Here. Vice Chairperson, Mr. Healy? Here. Chairperson, Mr. Carey? Present. And Weathersfield High School Student Representative, Tiago Wynn? Here. All Thank present. You. Yeah. Thank you, Ellen. Welcome, Tiago. And Tiago, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Absolutely. Thank you. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America, America. 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 One nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, justice for all. We would make a good commercial. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Moving on, Mr. Michaels, do you have a motion to approve the minutes from the September 22nd, 2020 meeting? So moved. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Are there any comments? Excellent, seeing no comments, with a motion and a second on the table, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Oh. Mo oh. Who's no, I said aye. Aye, so, no, okay. I'm no, I said aye, sorry. I'm a little late on the call there. No problem. Okay, motion passes. Public comment, Mr. Emmett, anyone on the phone? I have no one on the phone at this point in time, Mr. Carey. Yeah, so I'll read the email we got in our BOE comment email. It is from, and I should know their address, but Jamie Dirksen. First, I want to share some positive news. The Charles Wright PTO successfully hosted a socially distant scavenger hunt in Old Weathersfield this weekend. In lieu of a traditional fall event, our families completed competed by hunting for picture clues throughout Old Weathersfield and taking pictures of themselves in front of these clues. Our local businesses sponsored our scavenger hunt and our principal Glenn Horder was great sport by being well disguised clue himself. It was wonderful to see so many families having a fun while safe, safely supporting our school. It is definitely worth the mention that it is possible to reinvent the traditions in this new school year environment. I have a few questions regarding the reopening plan. When will families be given a survey regarding their updates, updated options from full or remote learning? I believe that the latest email was sent on October 2nd, stated the survey would be sent out earlier the following week. After it's done, will the public have the access to the results? Parents should have access to how many students are in remote learning per school and per class. Will the district will, will the district phases for reopening begin with the younger grades? This is common procedure for most schools as the younger learners are needy, neediest and working parents have give, been given the financial burden of hiring help or paying for daycare during remote days. In lieu of keeping remote Wednesdays to ensure the schools are deep clean, will the school district be looking to hire additional custodial staff to keep the schools clean each day? Many of these districts have opened full-time and had hired additional part-time custodians for each school to complete a thorough clean after the students leave for the day. If class size is an issue for some schools or classes, will the district be looking at additional buildings to use as an alternative setting that would be effectively house all the in-person students? If this is not an option, will you open the school that will you open the schools that can and keep those who cannot on hybrid schedule? Thank you for your attention to this matter. Jamie Dirksen. All right, no, no one's on the phone, right? No one's on the phone, Mr. Carey. Thank you, communications, Mr. Emmett. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Uh, thank you everyone and good evening. I have a few items uh, this evening. I'd like to start off with uh, a welcome uh, to Tiago Wynn. Uh, Tiago was elected by his peers to serve as the board rep for the 2020-2021 school year. Tiago, we look forward 
to hearing your updates on what has been and will continue to be a most unusual school year. I want to let everyone know that Weathersfield is one of 51 districts participating in a mock election for students in grades 11 and 12. Uh, this will happen during the week of October 19th through the 23rd, uh, next week. Weathersfield High School was proud to host a kickoff press conference this morning at Weathersfield High School. Lieutenant Governor Susan Beisowitz, Senator Matt Lesser, Education Commissioner Dr. Miguel Cardona, and Mayor Rell attended this morning's event. I'd like to say thank you to the WHS administration for coordinating this event as well as WHS teacher Nithi Rajan, who will serve to coordinate this election. Uh, just a reminder to everyone in the community, we have drive-through flu clinics. If there is one mitigation strategy that my friends at the Central Connecticut Health District can have me get across to the community, it is to make sure you get your flu shot. The uh, drive-through flu clinic will take place tomorrow Wednesday, October 14th from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And Thursday, October 15th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's over at the Pitkin Community Center. Uh, they have already run a flu clinic, uh, flu shot clinic in Berlin. And Charles uh, Brown reported that they had excellent turnout. The line stretched around the block. So members of the community, please make sure you get your flu shot. It's an extra level of protection. Um, I just want to make sure that I let everybody know, again, we have our second informational session on our Weathersfield Social Justice Coalition. That'll happen tomorrow morning at 8.30. Uh, this is the second of two. We had one already where we had 86 members of the community attend. Uh, tomorrow, we uh, have 52 members of the community registered uh, for this event. We look forward to a full kickoff of the Social Justice Coalition uh, at the end of this month on October 26th. So um, we've had some great uh, input from the community thus far, and we're looking forward to uh, more conversation tomorrow. Um, also, I want to talk during communications this evening about the process of reopening. Again, uh, Ms. Dirksen, thank you for the uh, questions. I had uh, responded to an email that we received uh, yesterday. And just want to bring everybody up to speed on this ever-changing process. Um, at this point in time, it's my expectation that we will have a survey going out tomorrow, along with a framework of what our reopening will look like. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to hold off on the survey is I got some feedback from parents around making sure that they had something with which to grasp prior to answering the survey. So let me give you some numbers at this point in time. Uh, with regard to Weathersfield families, um, we currently at the most recent data point had 16.5% of our families opting for the full remote learning option. Uh, that's not a huge number. Uh, Charles Wright has kind of led the way between 22 and 24% of the learners uh, uh, operating fully remote. And then we have schools like Highcrest, which barely had 10% of their learners um, full remote. So we wanted to make sure that we had a process. Now, let me be clear. I want to go back to July 23rd, where I talked about the fact that we would make our decisions based upon the health and the safety of our students and the health and the safety of our staff. We're not trying to be first here. We're trying to be safe. And what we're looking at doing is developing a plan that gradually brings in our students to an in-person experience. We're doing this fully aware of the fact that our health metric is going up. If you saw the news this evening, our positivity rate in the state of Connecticut is now up to 2.4%. In addition to that, we're monitoring the uh, local health data on a weekly basis through Central Connecticut Health District as well as the Department of Public Health. Our idea here in terms of developing a plan starting in November, the first week in November, is to begin to phase our students back in on a pre-K through one basis first, and then two weeks out, we would go grades two to four, and then two weeks beyond that, grades five and six. At the middle school level, we would look to bring in a team per grade every two weeks. And then at the high school level, we'll begin to bring the students back by grade, starting with grade 12. We want to make sure that we engage those 12th graders that are on the cusp of graduating and provide a 
uh, an experience for those 12th graders that are going to make sure that they are able to graduate and get the credits they need. Following the two weeks of grade 12, we'll next bring in our freshmen, grade nine, who have had a limited experience at the high school thus far, followed by grade 10 and then grade 11. So we're going to stretch this out over the course of the month of November, knowing full well that our numbers are subject to change. Our numbers in Weathersfield thus far, as you well know, we have a total of one individual that has tested positive in the Weathersfield Public Schools. Uh, I can tell you that the transmission was not traced back to the school district. It was traced out into the community. And I will say, we are starting to see an increase in the number of cases within our families. That is a reality. And when we look at our data thus far, it certainly speaks to the effect of the efficacy of the hybrid model, as well as our mitigation strategies. One of the things I want to make sure we talk about also are the mitigation strategies. Issue number one for us, if we bring more students into the schools, we know full well that we are going to be decreasing the social distance opportunity. That is going to make mask wearing and hand washing and staying home when you are sick that much more important. And I will say from all of my travels across the district, the compliance with masks has been excellent. We also know that there's going to be a tremendous amount of, of change. And let me give you an example. On Friday, I talked with you about the meetings that we had had with uh, administration. And I made mention of the idea of gators. And right now, one of the things that we talked about through DPH was gators, they're, they're on the fence with them. There was a study that talked about the fact that gators were ineffective. The DPH wasn't sure of that. So excuse me, I don't know what a gator is. A gator is a <laughs> a gator is a piece of neckwear that goes oh. around the neck and you pull it up and it's a thin material. So we okay. were talking on Friday. Oh, I know what you mean. We were talking on Friday around having to expand the ban on gators and go with just a cloth mm -hmm. mask. And over the course of the weekend, additional uh, research came out that said gators are very effective. So we have a constantly moving picture of, you know, what the research says and what the numbers say. So we obviously know that we're going to have to continue to be vigilant and we're going to have to make sure that we're able to make adjustments. But the idea is to get this framework out tomorrow along with the survey so that we can see if we're going to have any adjustment in that 16.5% number and we see additional um, students coming back into the district or students going out. And I will say from our data thus far and talking with our administrative team, we are seeing more students come back into the district off from remote learning than we are seeing hybrid going to remote. So there's still a lot of fluidity with regard to this. And again, I think the idea also is making sure that we are making the decision based upon the health metrics and the best interest of health and safety of kids. The other thing I wanna make sure that the public is aware of as we move forward in bringing more students in on in-person learning, there's the caveat to that. The more students we bring in on in-person learning, the more potential we have for having to quarantine a larger number of students. Certainly at the middle and the high school, cohorting is much more difficult. Um, at the elementary level, we can still maintain cohorting. However, it's going to be more students within a classroom. So rather than potentially having eight students in a hybrid go home, you might have the whole 16 students going home and quarantining for two weeks. And again, uh, we're looking at it from a perspective of a close contact. Um, Chloe uh, Bobrowski, our nursing supervisor, is uh, very, very important in helping to devise what that contact tracing looks like along with the Central Connecticut Health District. So there'll be much more information forthcoming tomorrow um, to the community so that we can make the best possible decisions in getting our kids back safely and, and securely. So, and with that, that's communications this evening. Michael, I have a question. Chuck? Yeah, no, board comment, wait till board comment. Okay. Yeah, it was just communication. I learned that, Bob, I have quite a bit of <laughs> I am. I'm new at this. <laughs> action, I, action items. Mr. Emmett, teacher evaluation. 
Yes, uh, this is a uh, report and discussion item. I just want to bring everybody up to speed. Um, given this unusual year, um, our teacher evaluation committee had the opportunity to meet. Uh, and I just want to bring everybody up to speed on uh, the fact that there are some new flexibilities this year. Um, for our first and second year teachers, we have a minimum of three informal observations and one review of practice for all teachers new to the district. Uh, that's a change. For teachers in year three or beyond, it's a minimum of two informal and one review of practice. That's also a change from last year. Teachers with a minimum of one goal, one student learning outcome, or two indicators, IAGDs. Um, we have added two additional options. Option uh, number one is social emotional learning for students. That's a, a new category, as well as student engagement and or family engagement. That's also a new choice. And that's really indicative of the hybrid model, as well as those families that are learning remotely. And again, possible IAGDs, which must be supported with evidence, include social emotional learning for students. Um, one of the things that we've enhanced here in the district is our utilization of the second step curriculum. Uh, so that's another tool that teachers will be able to utilize. A couple of other uh, new items this year uh, involves stakeholder feedback. The CSDE recommends that educators prioritize the focus on implementing strategies for ongoing communication and engagement with families. Um, that is critically important, especially for those families that are learning full remote. And again, I wanna be clear on this one. This is an important one on the summative feedback, end of year summative ratings, uh, rating scale of one through four are waived for the 2020-2021 school year. There is no final year end score. At year-end conference, teachers and evaluators will discuss the teacher practice goal, evidence toward the IAGDs, and the parent feedback goal. So those are the major structural changes with regard to the teacher evaluation instrument. Um, if you have any further questions or um, comments, I'd be happy to bring this uh, before the uh, Student Programs and Services Committee meeting that we have upcoming. Uh, Michael, you could probably answer this. You may have just answered it. Um, how many goals does each teacher have to do? One or yes. one? One SLO with two uh, indicators, two IAGDs. Okay, okay. And this is a one-time thing from the state, so everyone knows. Yeah. Correct. One, so one-time offer for one year. Correct. <laughs> you Elaine know, I sat I in the committee. A lot. I wish they would, you know, I hope when we go back, that we don't go all the way back, that we have some kind of a hybrid of um, including this. Any other questions or comments? No. Nope. Excellent. Can you, Mr. Um, nope, this is me, sorry. Okay, information and announcements, please check your packet. We do have some meetings scheduled. If you cannot make it, please let your chair know. If you're a chair of a committee and you want to Schedule a meeting, reach out to the administrator who is, works with you on that committee. Number seven, Board of Education meetings held. Facilities and Maintenance Committee. I know John couldn't make it. Mr. Emmett, do you want to give us an update? Yeah, I'd be happy to, uh, Mr. Carey. Uh, we held a uh, facilities and maintenance uh, subcommittee meeting last Thursday evening. Um, I did tape it, it was done through Zoom, so it is posted up on our website. Uh, we had a presentation by Physical Services Director Sally Katz who provided an update on uh, where we are with our physical buildings. Uh, from a standpoint of our heating systems and our ventilation systems, uh, ventilation systems are all working across the district. Uh, at the most recent town council meeting, the town council approved a project that will have a third party vendor come in and put in glycol into our systems. Uh, to ensure that our heating systems do not freeze during the coldest winter months. Um, the CDC guidelines talk about maximizing the amount of outside air coming in. Um, so with our dampers being open, um, we have found that we have plenty of air coming in. As it gets colder, we're going to have to heat that air. And we want to make sure that our systems do not uh, end up freezing or that's a huge 
uh, cost, as well as the fact we'd likely have to close a school. So um, Ms. Katz explained that this will be happening before the coldest winter months and that uh, she was in contact with the vendor. Uh, in addition to that, I also made mention of the fact that I had Charles Brown, the director of the Central Connecticut Health District, come out uh, last Monday and look at all of our buildings. Uh, he took a look at ventilation. He took a look at our mitigation strategies uh, and offered feedback. Uh, he was pleased with what he saw with regard to ventilation and was also pleasantly surprised by the mass compliance. So um, that is the report for facilities and maintenance. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. You're welcome. Meeting scheduled. We have a WEC meeting, 10-20-20 at 6.30 p.m. Correct council meeting, 10-21-20 at 11.30 a.m. And our finance and operations committee meeting is 10-27-20 at 6 p.m. There is no unfinished business. Public comment, Mr. Emmett, anyone on the phone? I have no one in the queue at this time, Mr. Carey. Thank you. Board comment, any members of the board wishing to make comment? Yeah, I have a comment if I could just find it. Okay. Uh, I'm all set. No, nope. Bob is going, I think. Am I going? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. There was another meeting that was held this week, which isn't part of our committee meetings, and it was the Weathersville Education Foundation, and they met on um, virtually on Thursday, September 24th. We discussed a memorial gift from the donations made to Dan Silver, one of the WEF, who was one of the WEF founding board members. We also had a continuing discussion about the Keisha Farm and what are the possibilities moving forward for the Weathersfield Education Foundation to be part of its development. Um, the foundation is working on a fundraiser, which we all know is so difficult today, which um, is to raise money. It's in collaboration with the new restaurant, the Charles, and we're calling it cook along and it's actually a cooking lesson that you have to pay a ticket for you have to buy the ingredients through them and then this chef teaches you how to make this um charles meal and that will be on there will be a lot of advertisement about that um the other meeting was the hat meeting and hat is always so interesting they're doing so much and michael we did get the waiver that all children will be able to get free breakfast and lunch for the rest of the year in Wethersfield. Um, also, they are doing a weekend program that they will um, be able to have, um, I guess, lunch and, lunch and breakfast again. Um, we do need more advertisement to get people to go for the breakfasts, which are both hot and cold. Um, there's been an approval for a Let's Tackle Hunger Food Drive. The food drive will start October 19th until October 30th. Announcements will go out to the students soon and bins will be located at the front and pool entrances as the high school is working on this. Um, the Dazzling Dozen, they have a new strategy of letting um, the group that's in charge, which is the Weatherfield Democrats, are doing October. The Weathersfield Women for Progress found out that if they sent out notices where the bins were, they had a good response. Um, and Rebecca Anderson, who is a co-president of the Emerson Williams PTO, would like to create little free pantries in Weathersfield, you know, like the little libraries they have. She would like to do a little pantry. So the long discussion on that. And they finally came to the idea of having, um, first and foremost, get it confirmed with the health department. Secondly, to learn more about them. And thirdly, to get permission for the next step, which is to put them in these locations. Um, these people are really a dynamic group to work with and they have a lot of interaction. So more information to come from them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Granato. Ms. Paradise. Um, Michael, you said we're going to send a survey and a framework update to parents. Will you send that to us too? I absolutely will. Yes. Okay. Um, and when we go back to full opening, we're going to go to lunch in the cafeterias. Yeah, what we're looking. Or classroom. At, yeah, what we're looking at right now is we're looking at uh, expanding lunches out into cafeterias. Uh, it is dependent upon the building. Uh, one of the things we're, we're looking at is being able to uh, purchase some new modular tables 
which will allow us the flexibility to be able to socially distance kids. Um, Charles Wright has these modular units already and they're actually quite excellent. They break down from an eight foot down into a four foot uh, and they, the tops actually will break down so you can make it into a bench. Uh, right oh. now we've got, as Matt tells me, at least a six week lead time. So we're looking at the potential of being able to uh, rent folding tables for the intern so we can keep kids eating lunch in the same direction and we can keep them socially distant. So that's one of the aspects we're working on now. Um, and how is instrumental music being delivered? Instrumental music, I will get that information for you uh, for the Friday update. I know that uh, Sally met with the uh, music teachers and they had worked on a plan. So I will get that information to you for Friday. I don't have all the details on that. That's fine, that's fine. And um, music and lunch. Can, are teachers assigned to lunch duty, Mike, still? Or are they getting a break on that with this COVID? Yeah, tip. How's tip, that working? Yeah, it, it depends uh, building by building, Elaine, but most have lunch outside the classroom. Uh, one of the things we tried to do was add some additional uh, lunch aids. And one of the things we've done over the course of the fall with regard to lunch, uh, we have really relied upon having the students eat lunch outside. So we're gonna try oh, and do that as long as we possibly can. So yeah. like for example, when Charles and I were out last uh, Monday, um, one of the things we saw over at Emerson Williams was the kids were outside eating and they were socially distanced and it was a perfect opportunity. So we're trying to so give teachers are Go ahead. Are teachers assigned a lunch duty time like they used to be? Or are they yes. just, have it, they been excused? Yep. Yes, in some cases, still? yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. Just thought we could give them a break. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Hey, I have, um, I have one kind of question concern that I'm sure will be addressed um, when you kind of give us some of the framework information. But as I was um, watching my first grader do her distance piece of the learning, it occurred to me how much, how crazy it's going to be for those younger grades, for those teachers to be able to facilitate both at the same time. So I'm thinking of like, you know, having 15 kids in the classroom and a couple of kids at home, that's gonna be really hard. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested and curious as to see what the plan for that is. Yeah, a very good question. That's something that we talked about with the administrative group on Friday. We talked about it at admin team again today. And I know that principals were talking with leadership teams about that. Right now, it, it is as if teachers are really focused heavily on the students on the screen, as opposed to the students in the classroom. And, you know, we want to make sure that we're being equitable in terms of giving time and space to students. That's one of the reasons, Kelly, we're looking at trying to get the survey data so we can see exactly how many families are going to actually opt sure. to continue with that remote piece. That's another one of the things to think about too, is it's looking at it from a perspective of, uh, you know, phasing out the hybrid. I mean, assuming we can get to the point where the metrics go down and things look good for us, we'd be phasing the hybrid out altogether. The state has been clear in articulating that uh, they are not going to eliminate the uh, remote learning option for parents. So parents still have the ability to do that. I think one of the things we're gonna have to be careful of Kelly also is with the remote learning model. It's not one of those things where you can kind of pick and choose when you wanna do it because I think that creates a lot of anxiety for the teacher. And so again, let me give you an example. One of my uh, neighboring districts they have the option if a parent wishes to go from full remote to full in-person, that's a process that takes a week. So it allows the teacher the opportunity to plan and to prepare. So it's not just like one of these, well, today I decided to go remote and then tomorrow I'm going full in, then the day after I'm gonna go remote. I will say we've had some resourceful parents where we've had students who are, who are sick, who are not feeling well, that are supposed to be in say cohort one and they will join remotely while they're homesick. That creates a challenge for the teacher, but on the same token, it's a win-win in that 
the parent realizes the child is ill, and what is the parent doing? The parent is keeping the child home. That's a, that's a key component. So um, we definitely think we're going to have to fine tune that, Kelly, and that's going to be conversation that's going to be ongoing. Sure. Thank you. That makes sense. You're welcome. Um, and then I just wanted to make one quick comment. Um, a, and it piggybacks off of Elaine's question that um, my fourth grader over at Hanmer um, started her instrumental lesson last week. She missed the first one because she didn't read her email. But um, so she's starting the viola. And um, I think it's really cool that they're teaching her how to do these things. And she's in this little group and she goes out and she learns her instrument. And um, they've set her up with all these cool things. And it was super seamless to go and rent them over in East Hartford. So, um, you know, big kudos to the program. It's still going on. I was really worried that they were going to miss that opportunity, but um, I'm very, very, as I continue to be very pleased with how everything is going so far this year. And I wanted to mention it because it's so cool that they're still learning. Thank you. Yeah. And Kelly, to your point, I know at the middle school, we're dealing with the challenge of where to put the band and orchestra. <laughs> last week because there are so many how do we socially distance them you've also got chorus as well chorus is going to go in the auditorium so we're trying to figure out ways to use the the smaller gym where they have gymnastics so that is a a work in progress and i do know at the high school level i talked with uh, mike bowles the band director and i know he was waiting on some music based ppe for i believe woodwind instruments so i'll have an uh, update for you in the friday update with regards cool. to Thanks. Thank you for the feedback. Thank you, Mr. Lesser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to report the Career Advisory Board met September 28th, our first meeting of the year, and we will meet every Monday, the last Monday of the month. As you guys remember, this board was developed to help build career skills, um, college readiness and career readiness for our students and link them to the business community. And we have seven activities. I'm going to read through these quickly. Seven activities that went out to our community where they could possibly volunteer to help our students. First, a career interview, an, an opportunity to be interviewed approximately 10 to 15 minutes and recorded by Mark Danaher and have the interview shared with the high school students. Number two, lunch and learn, an opportunity to share your career story with a small group of students over lunch for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Students are encouraged to ask questions. Number three, field research with a student, an opportunity for a student to talk to you one-on-one -on -one to ask you direct questions about your career, typically 10 to 20 minutes. Number four, a mock interview. This is a 15 minute commitment with 10 minute interview and a five minute feedback session. Number five, industry tour, a chance to come to your place of employment for the students so they can see the inner workings and understand what's happened uh, in an office or in a, in a business. Number six, class presentation. Give a presentation on your industry, talk about your field, answer questions, and bring your experience into the education curriculum. And last, number seven, this is a two-hour commitment in a, the small gym to meet students and answer questions about your career. This year, we are looking to do these in many career pods of similar careers with small groups of students for 30 to 40 minutes with groups of students rotating to each professionally virtually uh, each professional virtually using break rooms on the video platform. This is all going to be coordinated by or is being coordinated by Mark Danaher, but I want to thank Michael, Bobby and Jim who are active participants in the career advisory board uh, that's helped led by Mark Danner. So these are seven opportunities. If you guys want to be involved in one of these or, or any of these or know of someone who might be uh, good uh, for one of these seven, you can get it to me or you can go directly uh, to Mark in terms of participating in one of these seven uh, career related activities for the students. That's all I have, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lester. Anyone else wishing to make a comment? Yes, Tiago. So I've been talking to many students and uh, many of them ex uh, have expressed concerns about the uh, upcoming resurgence of or the coming back of students. Um, several students have uh, mentioned to me that if, uh, if too many students came back and they felt overwhelmed, that many students would uh, begin to go full remote. So I just wanted to bring it to the attention that 
many students feel that potentially the um, the new model should be uh, postponed until after um, the holiday break. This isn't all students, but uh, several students have mentioned it to me. Yeah, Tiago, thank you for that input. I think that's you know one of the reasons why, in in lieu of doing a full all in everybody at once, the idea of doing it by one grade level, and, and again, the number for the number of twelfth graders is is not huge. And doing it with biweekly, the typical incubation period is two weeks. So that group coming in would have two weeks to see if we had a spike. One of the concerns for me, I've said it many times, is the issue of we just started playing sports. We will not be at the two week mark of, of fall sports until Thursday. So we're, we're looking at that factor. And you know, again, I said it earlier, we're, we're seeing the numbers go up at this point in time. Obviously for planning purposes, eventually things are gonna get better and I wanna get everybody in, but um, you rest assured, Tiago, we won't rush this. We're gonna try and do it methodically and making sure you're safe. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. All right, anyone else? Yes, Bobby. Um, I just wanted to ask Michael um, a, a, first a comment and then a question. Um, I'm hearing so often that our students don't know anything about civics. They don't know how the government runs. I was so thrilled to hear you say they were having a mock election um, and I'm sure all the knowledge that goes behind how you would have an election. So I'm thrilled that that's going on. And also, um, there, is there a moderator for the um, social justice group? Somebody who will be willing to ask the difficult questions that people will be working with? Yeah, we have a uh, facilitator, Bobby, Ingrid Kennedy, uh, who is the executive director for CERC the uh, State Edu Education Resource Center. Uh, Ingrid has worked with other districts and other towns with regard to social justice coalitions, including uh, most recently the Southington Public Schools. So she has been a, um, a driving force um, with getting this off the ground. And judging by the number of uh, sessions that we've had with the two sessions and the number of people that have been engaged, I think that it is long overdue that we have conversation around this particular topic. So. Right, I think it's great. Um, and as it goes along with the idea our students are learning civics, I hope everyone will get out and vote. This is an important year to vote. There are absentee ballots that you can put into the absentee ballot box in front of the town hall. Um, and I hope people will take this right, this privilege and vote for this November. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Welcome, Tiago. It's great to have you. We look forward to hearing from you and learning from you the perspective of, from the high school. Seeing no other comments, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So, do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Motion passes. Everyone have a great night. Stay safe. You Thank too. You. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Take care.